David O'Sullivan here and welcome to the fourth episode of Monthly Film Roundup. In this video I'll be looking back at all the films released in June and giving my thoughts and opinions on each one of them before naming my pick of the month at the end of the video. First up I have to say I haven't seen all of the films that came out in June, there was a lot of releases this past month. There was a lot of films that I wasn't able to check out. For example The Conjuring 2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows, Me Before You. Those films I wasn't able to check out, but there were six films I was able to see, and as you will have seen from the intro, the films that I will be talking about in this video are Elvis and Nixon, Now You See Me 2, Central Intelligence, The Nice Guys, When Marnie Was There, and Independence Day Resurgence. Three of those films I've already partly talked about, The Nice Guys have already kind of partly covered in another video, my uh, supporting original films video, I kind of already touched upon it in that video. And I've also done two separate, you know, individual reviews for both When Marnie Was There and Independence Day Resurgence. So those three films I will be talking about in this video, but more briefly than the other three which I haven't yet talked about. And also one final thing that I need to address is that both Finding Dory and The Neon Demon were released in June in the US, but they don't come out here in the UK until July, so I will be seeing those two films, but I won't be able to talk about them until my July film roundup, because like I said, they're not released here yet in the UK, but as soon as they come out, I will see them, but I won't be talking about them until the next episode. So, without further ado, let's not waste any more time, and the first film I'm going to be talking about is Elvis and Nixon. Now, Elvis and Nixon is the uh, true story comedy drama, which revolves around the meeting between Elvis Presley and President Nixon that happened in 1970. It's a true story. Basically, the film is really all about just Elvis Presley meeting President Nixon. And Elvis really wants to get this badge to become this federal agent. He's desperate to become this secret undercover agent for the FBI. And he manages to get a meeting with President Nixon and it all revolves around that situation and how that scenario comes to happen, really. I go Going into this film, I didn't have massively high expectations. I was hoping to like it. I like the look of the trailer, like it's giving this fun, quirky uh, a comedy drama. And I was actually pleasantly surprised. It's what I uh, wanted it to be. And it wasn't the best film ever. It wasn't a great film necessarily. It wasn't one of the best films of the year or anything. But I think it did what it needed to do. And I think it did it as well as it could have done, you know, because there wasn't really a whole lot to the film. It was essentially Elvis Presley wants to get this badge, you know, his federal agent, he has this meeting with President Nixon, and it's basically about these two very different, yet strangely similar figures meeting, and just the two of them meeting one another, and it basically, all of the story revolves around that. And you would think, okay, there's not much to it, it might get a little boring, but it didn't. It was consistently uh, fun and entertaining. One of the biggest positives I can give this film, um, one of the best things I liked about it was that it was a really kind of quirky, kind of eccentric uh, comedy drama because a lot of uh, biographical films nowadays, they play it very seriously. Like it, it can be very dark and intense and serious and dramatic. And But with this film, it wasn't that. It was it, it did try to do something different. It was more of a, a comedy drama, which I really like because the whole situation and this the whole like, scenario itself is a very kind of bizarre one. It's very kind of like when you're watching it, they really play up to how kind of surreal and bizarre and strange and just really weird and random and crazy this whole situation is. And I really liked how they played up the comedy of that because you wouldn't think it was a true story, but it is. It really happened. They didn't have a transcript from the actual meeting itself, but there were two young guys who were the president's uh, like personal assistants, if you will, who were like in and around the, the room at the time. So I'm pretty sure they kind of, kind of consulted uh, the makers of the film to try and get it as accurate as they possibly could. I think apparently from what I've heard it's quite different from what actually happened. Uh, they had a lot of leeway because like I said there wasn't an actual transcript of what was said and what actually happened. So they, but in that way I think it was good because they had a little bit more kind of creative freedom to kind of do what they wanted to do. They weren't kind of slave to the, what, the original kind of transcript of what actually happened because like I said they could kind of do what they wanted and do their own thing in a sense. And also another thing I really liked about the film were the performances. Um, because like I said, even though there wasn't, there wasn't a lot to the story, it really was all about Elvis and Nixon. And I think both Michael Shannon and Kevin Spacey did a great job in the two titular roles. Because neither of them really look 
it, like the characters they're playing. Kevin Spacey doesn't really look like Presley Nixon, and Michael Shannon really doesn't look like Elvis Presley at all, but they both did a great job in their performances of really selling it to us, because I was really worried that that would be like a distraction for me, like, they don't really look like them. That's not usually a really big problem for me, because Steve Jobs, which came out last year, I absolutely loved, I thought it was a great film, and I really like Michael Fassbender in the lead role, despite the fact that he looks nothing like Steve Jobs. He delivered a great performance in the role, and you really bought into it. But the difference with this film was that the fact that Elvis and Nixon, Elvis Presley, Presley Nixon, are really big, well-known, famous uh, figures in history, and it's like, it might have been a little distracting, a little off-putting, the fact that the actors don't look exactly like them, but like I said, they both did a great job. They do try to make themselves look more like Elvis and like Nixon, and they do a great job of really kind of emulating the, the people that they're playing, like Michael Shannon trying to, you know, become an Elvis in a sense, and Kevin Spacey really kind of trying to emulate uh, Nixon and his mannerisms and how, how he acts, and I think they both did a great job. Kevin Spacey didn't really get a whole lot to do, because really we only ever saw him when he was in the over office in the White House. We didn't really get anything else from him and his character. We only really saw him, like I said, in the White House, in the over office. We didn't really get much of him outside of that. But Elvis, we did get a surprise thing he large amount of. It was really his film, it all kind of revolved around him and what he wanted, how he wanted this badge, he wanted to meet the president. And like I said, Michael Shannon did a really good job because I was like, what really Michael Shannon as Elvis Presley? I, I can't see that. I can't see that at all. I think Michael Shannon is a great actor, don't get me wrong. I, I really like him as an actor and I think he's really good, but I just couldn't see him as Elvis. But like I said, he did a great job at really emulating Elvis in like the way he talked and his mannerisms. And one of the other things that I really liked was that like, it wasn't just like an actor doing an impression of Elvis Presley. It was a little bit like that in a way. He had, he had the clothes, the you know, recognisable outfits, the, the voice. But as well as that, we got a kind of instances. And what made the film better than just, you know, a, a, a fun, you know, okay film was the fact that we got these couple of scenes and moments it was only a couple of moments, but in those two scenes, we really got a kind of deeper look into who Elvis really is, who Elvis the man is underneath, deep down. And other than those two scenes, it's really kind of Elvis as you, is the kind of comedy is played up, like, and how he's kind of quite a kind of a, uh, eccentric character. He just does what he wants and he doesn't really care what other people think in a sense. But in those two moments, we really got a kind of deeper look and understanding into who he is as a man deep down underneath behind this facade. And I really like those two moments. For me, those two moments help really help to elevate the film. And I think the biggest criticism I would give this film, even though overall I really liked it, I liked the whole fun, quirky, eccentric, comedy, drama vibe, I really liked the style of it. It felt very much like a 70s film, kind of like Inherent Vice in a way, isn't it? but Inherent Vice was a much crazier, more over-the-top eccentric film. This doesn't go as far as, say, Inherent Vice, but it has that kind of same kind of vibe to it, set in the 70s, quirky, funny, you know, it's got the music there. But like I said, even though I liked the film overall and I found it fun and enjoyable and, you know, decent enough for what it was, for me it never quite got to that level of greatness where even though it wasn't a serious, dramatic, you know, biographical drama, and I know that wasn't what they were going for, I think if they did interject scenes that were more serious and more dramatic, like those two moments that I mentioned, I think it would have really helped to elevate the film and make it a lot more dramatic and a lot more of a better film. But saying that, we did get those two moments, and also it wasn't really what they were going for. They were going for a more fun, eccentric, quirky, comedy vibe. And in that respect, they succeeded really well. I, I was, you know, pleasantly surprised by this film. I had a fun time. It was probably better than I was expecting. Um, but it was pretty much what, what I expected to get. It wasn't anything great. It was one of the best films of the year, but it did, like I said, it did what it needed to do, as well as it could have done, I, I thought. Uh, I think Elvis and Nixon were both the stars of the show. I think Michael Shannon and Kevin Spacey did a great job in those two roles. They were really the two standouts, all roles around them, those two characters, that meeting, which was really worth it. The comedy in it, how the bizarre, surreal kind of humour is played up, how kind of crazy and you know, surreal this situation is and it's actually happening these two figures are actually meeting I think it was really well done I probably would recommend going to see it Elvis and Nixon like I said it wasn't the greatest film but if you want to see a film that was fun it was entertaining it was enjoyable and you can have a good time and a fun quirky comedy drama type film I think you will enjoy this film so there we go 
Elvis and Nixon. Now the next one we're going to be talking about is Now You See Me 2. Now You See Me 2, of course, is the sequel to Now You See Me, which came out back in 2013, I think. And I have to admit, I'm not a massive fan of the first Now You See Me. I think it's perfectly fine. I do like the film. I think it's uh, pretty good. Uh, it's a, just a fun, enjoyable film. It's, it's just a harmless film. It's perfectly fine. You know, it wasn't anything great. It was a fun heist movie. It's kind of cool crime caper. But with this film, I was hoping to get something that was just a decent enough good movie that was fun and enjoyable but it wasn't even that I just I just I really didn't like this film and I was really disappointed because I wasn't expecting anything great you know I was hoping it would just be as good as the first film just a fun movie that you can enjoy and have a good time but it wasn't even that it just got boring fast it just felt like such a retread of what they did in the first film they tried to do the same kind of thing but it just didn't work nearly as well as it did in the first film. Like, we had these kind of performances when the four horsemen were on the stage. Not even they were fun. Like, in the first film, those were cool and fun to watch. Even though it was quite, you know, crazy over the top what they were doing. You kind of buy into it. They kind of explain what was going on and what, what, how they did it. In this film, they tried to do that. They tried to have these acts where they're on stage performing. But it's just not any fun. It just feels so old hat. Like, oh, we've just seen this all before. They're just doing the same kind of thing they did in the first one, but not nearly as well. And it just doesn't work, it feels so repetitive, it feels so tiring, it feels so boring, and it gets boring surprisingly very quickly. I was checked out of the film so early on, and just as I thought I couldn't get any more unbearable, Woody Harrelson's twin comes on the screen. And in case you don't know, a lot of reviewers have mentioned it, but Woody Harrelson's character has a twin in this film, also played by Woody Harrelson. <sighs> I didn't know what the hell was going on. By that point, I was like, okay, we had the inciting incident, they were whisked off this location, I was like, okay, let's get going now, let's get momentum, let's get going, let's get more fun and energetic, let's get, let's get going with this. And then suddenly, we get Woody Harrelson's twin appears on the screen, I'm like, what the hell is going on now? It's like, and they tried to play this kind of comedy aspect, like, but it just doesn't work, like, it's funny, but in a bad way, it's like unintentionally funny. And when it tries to be funny, it just falls flat and doesn't work. And I just don't know what the hell they were thinking with putting a character in this film that was Woody Harrelson's twin. I just don't get what the hell was going on. Because by that point, I didn't like the film. I found it tiring. I found it repetitive. I found it boring. It not long just started. But I was like, oh, come on, let's get going. We can pick this up now. We can get going and have some fun. But then by that point, as soon as Woody Harrelson's twin came on the screen, it almost become like a parody of itself. Like, it was bad enough as it was. Bad enough being just a tiring, repetitive, boring film. But then by the time that happened, it became almost like a, a mockery of itself. Almost like a Now You See Me parody. I don't know what was going on. It's like, because the first film, it, it's, it's not serious. It's not supposed to be the most serious film in the world. You're not supposed to spend just disbelief and the things that happen are kind of like quite over the top and out there. But you can... You can kind of buy into it in the first film anyway. But with this film, there's so much stuff that happens that's so ludicrous and crazy and over the top. It just goes way too far. Because the first film, there was that line where it could have crossed that line. It could have got just gone too far. It could have gone too over the top. But it didn't. It, it, it was quite far-fetched and outlandish and over the top in parts. But you can kind of buy into it and they kind of explained it as it was going along and you were like oh yeah okay, okay I suppose that could happen I suppose you could do that but with this film almost every single trick and magic acting illusion is so completely and utterly crazy and over the top and they're trying to do the same kind of thing of explaining it explaining how they did it but it just doesn't work it just comes off as a joke it's like really? is that what is it? it just became like I said almost a parody of itself like they were trying to do the same kind of thing as the first one but it didn't work nearly as well and it became almost a joke it became so bad and just as I thought I couldn't be on board with the movie any less it got irritating from a filmmaking perspective technically at least the first film was a good film it was well done Louis Leturier who did the first film I'm not a massive fan of his I think he did an okay job with the Clash of the Titans remake I like what he did with the Incredible Hulk and he's got a sense of energy and dynamism in his direction but with the director here I'm not really familiar with who he is or his work but it just felt so lazy and uninspired and just like such a repetitive tiring boring retread 
of what we've already seen and it wasn't done nearly as well. We got new elements in there which really didn't work that really fell flat and just felt really out of place. There were so many technical glitches in the film that really bugged me. Like at least the film wasn't irritating. It was tiring, it got repetitive, it got boring, it got annoying, but then it started irritating me and it bugged me in terms of how it was filmed. There were so many shots where it would just suddenly cut and characters would be in different positions or different places and it just kept happening. I don't know if the average person would notice it as much as say I did, but it just kept happening and it kept bugging me and I know it wasn't on purpose. You could tell it just it was making mistakes, continuity errors and it just kept happening. Characters suddenly in different positions and it just it felt very jarring and it really bugged me. I mean there are things that I liked about this film. Mark Ruffalo's character is one of my favourite part. It was my favourite part of the first film. I mean I liked the first film but I think Mark Ruffalo was the, the best part. It really all revolved around him and he really carried that film. I liked him in this film as well. I think he did a good job. I also liked Lizzie Kaplan as the new female horseman. She of course replaces Isla Fisher. I wasn't a massive fan of Isla Fisher. I think she did a good enough job in the first film. She was serviceable. She didn't get a whole lot to do, but she was fine. She was good enough. So I wasn't that upset when she dropped out there to replace her Lizzie Captain. I thought Lizzie Captain was good. She did a really good job of filling that role. You could tell she was having fun and enjoying herself and you could really have fun whenever she was on screen as well. And also there was a sequence in regards to the, a, a card sequence when they were all throwing this card around they got this computer chip and they put it into this card and they were throwing this card around. It's completely ludicrous and over the top how, how, how it happens. It's like, because in the first film, Dave Franco is the only one who's good with a card, but in this one, they all learn how to be really good with a card and they're all flicking this card around, throwing it around. It, 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 you can't really buy into it, but at least it's a fun, cool, standalone sequence. It kind of plays into this larger plot of them getting this computer chip that Daniel Radcliffe wants them to get. But then it can expose him and they want to get it off. He wants to get it from them, but then they want to keep it from them and he want to use it against him. And then they don't really actually have it and they want to pretend that they have it. And it's, I, I don't know what really was going on to be honest with you. It's like they were trying so desperately hard to recapture what they did well in the first film. And it just really falls flat and falls apart and really doesn't work. So as you may have figured, I really didn't like Now You See Me 2. I really wouldn't recommend seeing it. If you're a fan of Now You See Me and you're really excited for this film, I would say check it out. You may like it, you may find some enjoyment in it. I don't know, just me personally, I didn't find it any fun at all. I found it repetitive and tiring and boring and annoying and aggravating and irritating and it just really I really took against it even though I really wanted to like it going in I really wanted to have fun and enjoy it I don't think it was going to be the greatest film but I wanted it to be like the first film I wanted it to be just a fun harmless movie that was just a decent enough film that you could have fun and enjoy but like I said for me I didn't even find any enjoyment in it at all I didn't find it fun at all it really went me up the wrong way and I just really didn't like it so if you find out now you see me I would recommend probably going back and watching the first film it made me realise how much I actually liked the first film so yeah that's what I really have to say about now you see me too okay now the last new film that I'm going to be talking about is Central Intelligence. Now Central Intelligence is a new comedy film starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Kevin Hart had this kind of comedic double act, this kind of like odd couple, kind of a uh, big guy, little guy, kind of, you know, opposites, uh, double act comedy film. And I was actually excited to see this film. I'm not a big fan of modern comedy films. I don't really like comedy films of today, really. But the trailers, I liked. I thought the trailers, I had fun with the trailers, I enjoyed them. Uh, and I also liked the idea of it being Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart teaming up. I do like Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart, but I'm not a massive fan of either of them when they're on their own but I thought them teaming up in this kind of comedic double act comedy film I thought that could be really fun and yeah it was pretty much what we got it wasn't the greatest film I think it could have been better but for what it was for what it needed to be for what the trailers made it out to be it delivered so I can't really complain I think it could have been a better film like I said but as far as delivering on the comedy delivering on the the chemistry between the two leads, the performances of the two leads, the relationship they had, them working together, it, it, it fired on all cylinders. I can't really complain in that respect because I really like both Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart in this film. Like I said, I'm not a massive fan of either of theirs. I, li I like them both. I think they're both both good at uh, what they do. And it was cool to see them together. I really like them as this kind of comedic, odd couple, double act. 
Dwayne Johnson being the big guy and Kevin Hart being the little guy. But what I really liked, what they did slightly differently, was that they cast against type in a certain respect. Like Dwayne Johnson, he usually plays the, the serious, tough, straight guy. But he was more of the kind of crazy, silly, over-the-top one. And Kevin Hart was more of the straight, serious one. Uh, obviously, Kevin Hart's still very much like Kevin Hart. And Dwayne Johnson's still very much like Dwayne Johnson. But as far as, you know, Dwayne Johnson being the more silly one instead of being serious and tough and Kevin Hart being the more like, you know, straight coming serious, we need to do, you know, we can't go, we can't do anything stupid here instead of being like all crazy, you know. And I think that really the best thing about this film and the biggest positive I can give it is that the two leads were great as this kind of comedic double act because it really revolves all around that. So if they weren't any good, it would have really fallen flat and got really boring. But for me, Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart did a great job together as this comedic double act because that's what the film was really all about. It was about Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart teaming up in this comedy film. And I think they did a really good job at really selling it to us, how they bounce off one another, the chemistry they have, the relationship they have, the comedy back and forth between the two of them. I thought was great. It was really what drove the film, what the film was all really about. Because story-wise, it wasn't anything special. We had this kind of like spy-type story about the CIA, about something that they wanted that could leak codes on something I you know it was you know pretty pretty generic kind of uninspired story but you know I can't complain about that because it was about Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart that's what the film was all about it was about these two coming together as this comedic double act and that worked really well it was the best thing about this film because for me if it wasn't for those two it probably wouldn't have been as good as it was but they really made the film they really helped sell it to us sell the comedy to us for me the film was let down when the story kind of got in the way like they tried to have this story here this serious spy story and it kind of bogged the comedy down in some respect not too often not too much but it kind of got in the way in, in some cases this whole black badger thing that they keep going on about and keep having over our heads who is the black badger you know it just got a little kind of like okay just forget about it let's just have some fun here with the two leads and like I said that's what the film mainly did just that like whenever this storyline kept getting in the way it was like oh just get, just get out of the way I don't care about the black badger and they keep going on about it it was kind of good in the way and that it, it was quite intriguing like they've kind of played it as oh you don't really know who Dwayne Johnson is is he this kind of silly over the top guy that he makes out or is he quite deadly and serious and even he's putting on this side so it kind of kept you guessing in that respect and in, in that sense, I liked it because it was like, oh, so is he really like this silly, over-the-top, clownish guy? Or is he really deadly and serious and he's just hiding that? We don't know if he was telling the truth, wherever he is, who he says he is, or whether it's everybody else has got it wrong. And it kind of kept you guessing in that respect, which I liked. And I thought they did that well. Like, you really didn't know whether he was telling the truth or not, whether Kevin Hart should really believe him, or whether, you know, it was the other guys who were in the wrong, who really was the Black Badger. But, like I said, sometimes when they went too far with the whole Black Badger thing, it just got in the way a bit and it was like, okay, just enough of the Black Badger. If you haven't seen the film, you really know what the hell I'm talking about with this Black Badger thing, but I guarantee you, when you see the film, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They just keep going about the Black Badger all the time, to the point where it's like, okay, you can stop saying Black Badger. Especially come the end of the film, there's like this standoff where they're trying to figure out who the Black Badger is. Is Dwayne Johnson the Black Badger? Is this other guy the Black Badger? Who is the Black Badger? And they keep saying the Black Badger all the time. I... I <laughs> I feel like I'm saying the Black Badger all the time now, so I'm going to stop saying it because I'm becoming what the film... <laughs> I'm doing the same thing as the film is, and I'm just criticising the film for saying Black Badger all the time. And I'm saying Black Badger all the time. So enough about Black Badger, okay? No more Black Badger. So yeah, uh, overall, there's not a lot to say about Central Intelligence. It was pretty much, if you've seen the trailer, that's what the film is, you know. For me, I think the trailer gave away quite a lot of the good comedy moments. There was a lot of other comedy moments in the film, a lot of other gags and jokes, but for me, some of the best were in the trailer, which is a little annoying. It kind of happens all the time in comedy films. They put all the best bits in the trailer. But yeah, I think if you've seen the trailer, you like the trailer, you had fun with how it looks, and how it's presented in the trailer, you'll like the film, because the trailer is pretty much what the film is. And if you're a fan of Kevin Hart, if you're a fan of Dwayne Johnson, if you're a fan of comedic double act, comedy films I think you'll really like this film because it was good fun it was entertaining it was enjoyable for me one of the things that just didn't work was they tried to have these serious themes and issues in there about bullying and friendship and sticking together and standing up fighting against the bullies and another kind of film that was more serious and dramatic that would probably really work but in this film it felt out of place so much of the film was just this silly outrageous stupid uh, comedy like when they tried to play up this serious 
uh, theme and issue regarding bullying, it just didn't really work for me. The really big um, issue about bullying and the big message that it's trying to deliver, it's really all built upon the opening scene, which is a really silly, stupid, funny comedy scene. It's like we've got Dwayne Johnson's face CGI into this 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 little fat kid and it's silly and over the top and stupid and yet the whole serious theme and issue and message that they're trying to convey about bullying is all built upon that scene so it's like you can't really take it seriously because it's such a silly uh, stupid comedy scene and the whole film really is a silly comedy that when they try to put this serious uh, issue and uh, messages about bullying across it just doesn't really work because it just doesn't really mesh together with the rest of the film but other than that I like Sanjay Intelligence I didn't love it I didn't think it was a great film but I think like I said it was as good as it needed to be in terms of what the trailer made it out to look like it was it really delivered on what you would expect um, I think it could have been a better film I think they could have pushed it a bit further I think they could have made it even funnier could have done it even more but for what it was, I think it was it was fine. So, yeah, I would recommend going to see Central Intelligence if you're a fan of comedy films, if you're a fan of comedic double act comedy films, if you're a fan of Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart, I would go and see this film because it was good fun, it was entertaining, it was enjoyable, you can have fun with it. So, yeah, Central Intelligence. Okay, now our next song we're we'll talking about is the first of the three which I've already talked about partly already and it is The Nice Guys. Now The Nice Guys I haven't done a separate individual review of like for when Marnie was there and Independence and Resurgence but I've kind of already talked about it a bit in my supporting original films video but I will talk a little bit more about it here again but more briefly so overall I really like The Nice Guys I mean I really really liked it I thought it was absolutely great it technically it came out into May I think in the US we didn't get it here to the beginning of June so I thought I'd wait and talk about it in my June film roundup Warcraft on the other hand we got early end of May so I thought I'd talk about Warcraft in May and talk about Nice Guys here now in June so yeah uh, we didn't get it to the beginning of June but it was worth the wait I absolutely love The Nice Guys now it's kind of similar to Central Intelligence that it's a comedic double act kind of thing it's this uh, buddy cop kind of thing but I think The Nice Guys was a lot better. I'm obviously, they're very different kind of films. Central Florida is more, it's more of a silly film that appeals to more of a younger audience, I think, more of a broader audience with The Nice Guys. It's more, it's more violent, it's edgier, it's R-rated. They're not exactly the same. In terms of being like a comedic double act, I think The Nice Guys was far superior in terms of being a much better film. Like I said, I liked Central Intelligence. It was good fun. I liked it for what it was, but The Nice Guys for me was a really great film. I absolutely loved it. Russell Crowe, Ryan Gosling were so great in the lead roles as these two disparate individuals who kind of are on their own and they kind of find each other and become this kind of duo and it works really well. They play off each other so well. You can tell they get along really well in real life and the chemistry they have, the relationship they have on screen, the comedy they have, how it bounces off one another. And it's just, I just absolutely loved it. Also, the girl playing Ryan Gosling's daughter, Anguri Rice. I think that's her name. She was so great. I think she's got a really bright future ahead of her because she was so great in this. I mean, she was only around 13, 14, I think, when they filmed it. And she was so great. You think she was so much older than she was because she seems like such a talented, confident actress. Like, and she's only like a little kid. That's why we've got so many great up and coming young actors. That I just, they're all just so good delivering such good performances. But yeah, she did a really great job. She almost stole the show, I think, to me. But Russell Crowe, Ryan Gosling, the stars of the show, all rolled around there and they did such a great job. The comedy, how they played off one another. I also really liked the story as well. It was like this comedic uh, crime mystery drama kind of thing, and it was good because it was it was interesting, it was engaging. It, you never you never like got bored of it. You were constantly engaged in what was going on, trying to figure out what was going on, and yeah, it, it did take some twists and turns that were, that were a little jarring uh, in terms of like a certain character being killed off, especially that was like oh, whoa. But for me, that wasn't much of a big issue because. I kind of got over it quickly and it was mainly all revolving around Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling. So the fact this side character was killed off wasn't that big of an issue. It was quite shocking and came out of nowhere. But I kind of like that in a way because the film did take these very surprising twists and turns that you didn't expect. It wasn't formulaic, it wasn't generic, it wasn't predictable. It was very much 
a very unique original film. It was, you know, it's, I suppose you could compare it to Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and other kind of uh, double act uh, films in that respect, but it was very much its own thing. Like it wasn't trying to be like anything else, and it it stood on its own as a great original film in its own right. I thought it was really great. I would really recommend going to see the Nice Guys. It's quite a different film. It's not a, a safe kind of predictable, formulaic, you know, blockbuster movie. It, it quite it pushes the boundaries. It's quite different in certain respects. It does things you wouldn't expect. But I, like I said, I really liked that, and that's what I liked so much about it. It was very different. It wasn't afraid to push the brown G's. It was very kind of brave and daring and bold and audacious. It was really out there. It was violent. It was R-rated. It was just cool, stylish. I absolutely loved it. So yeah, couldn't say any more good things about the nice guys. Of these next two films now, When My Name Is There and Independence Day Resurgence, I have already done separate reviews of, like I said. You can check out my reviews of those two films if you want to. But for this video, instead of me talking again about what I thought, I'll just show you the summaries now from my two reviews of those two films. So first up, I'll show you the summary from my When My Name Was There review now. So here we go. So overall, When Marley Was There may not be Studio Ghibli's finest film, but it definitely ranks up there as one of their best. And if this does prove to be their last venture, then it was a great swan song. With deeply human and relatable characters, a mysterious and engaging story, and rich with gorgeously stunning visuals, When Marley Was There is a beautiful, poignant, heartfelt film, and an extremely touching farewell from what will surely go down as one of the best animation houses of all time. So yeah, I really like When Marley Was There. It's technically not a 2016 film. I think it came out like 2014 in Japan and it came out like this time last year in the US. We only just got it here in the UK this month in like a limited release. I'm not sure if I'm going to count it as a 2016 film or not because like I said it's not really a 2016 film but we only just got it here this month but it was worth the wait because I thought it was great. One of Studio Jimmy's best songs I thought I, I really liked it so yeah that's what I have to say about when Marnie was there. Now the final film, same as when Money was there, I have also done a separate review of that is Independence Day Resurgence. You can watch my Independence Day Resurgence review if you want, but in this video I'm just going to show you the summary from my Independence Day Resurgence review now, so here we go. Overall, Independence Day Resurgence is just everything you loved about the first film just dialed up. Bigger action, dumber plot, and more extravagant than ever before. With likeable and charismatic characters, an outrageously preposterous story, and brimming with outlandish humour and craziness galore, Independence Day Resurgence is just as big and damn and fun as you would hope for. So yeah, that's what I thought about Independence Day Resurgence overall. It wasn't a great film, but as a big, dumb, fun popcorn movie, I actually really enjoyed it and I had a good time, you know. Technically, it wasn't that great. I could find so much problems and issues in Independence Day Resurgence, but it didn't bug me in the way that Nice Me 2 did, because I had fun with it. It was, it, it was essentially did the same thing as the first film, but whereas Now You See Me 2 felt repetitive and tiring and boring, Independence Day Resurgence, for me anyway, I found it fun. And even though they were essentially doing the same kind of thing as the first film, it was silly and stupid and fun and over the top and they knew what it was. Like they're aware that it's just this silly, stupid, ridiculous thing. They are aware that it's not a very good film. Like it's it's self-aware in that respect. And that's what I liked about it. It was kind of poking fun at itself. The characters are kind of like poking fun at the situation. It's like they're in on the joke as well. So in that respect, I could enjoy it. I could go along for the ride and just poke fun at the film and just kind of laugh at how kind of like good bad it is, you know. And in that respect, I actually liked it and enjoy it. So there we go, Independence Day Resurgence. So there we go, that wraps up my monthly film roundup for June. Overall, it was another very mixed bag. I mean, there were some films that weren't very good and I didn't like at all. Like, you now you see me too. I really wasn't a fan. Independence Day Resurgence wasn't the greatest either, but at least I could have fun with that. Elvis and Nixon, Central Intelligence, I liked, I thought were good, I didn't think they were great, but I liked them for what they were, and I think they delivered on what they needed to be. And then we also got Nice Guys and My Marley Was There, which I absolutely loved and thought were great. So, <laughs> very different selection of films, all very different from one another, in terms of both quality and of what they were about. 
But for me, it comes down obviously to when Marty was there and the nice guys. I found this really hard. I've been thinking about this for so long of which one I want to pick. Because when Marty was there, technically isn't a 2016 film. You know, and like I said, it came out back in 2014. We've really just got it here now in the UK. So I'm not sure whether to call it my pick of the month or not. Because my pick of the month, the definition is not just the best one that I like the most or was my favourite, but the one that I'm recommending for people to go out and see. And when Marnie was there, only is in the UK at the moment in a limited release. So for that reason, I'm, I think it just edges out on the nice guys and I'm going to give it to the nice guys because I like the nice guys just as much as when Marnie was there, if not more. Again, it's hard to compare them because they're such different films, but I love the nice guys. I thought it was a great original film that deserves to be supported so i've got to give it to the nice guys and also whereas when money was there it's only playing in a limited release in the uk the nice guys i'm pretty sure it's been released everywhere all around the world is playing everywhere at the moment so my pick of the month for june 2016 is the nice guys And there we go, that wraps up another edition of Monthly Film Roundup, June in Review. And like I said, it was a very mixed bag, we've got some very different films. What do you guys think about the films that came out this past month? Let me know down below, I'd love to know your thoughts on the films, or the films that I saw and I talked about, or maybe the films that I didn't get the chance to see as well. And if you like this video, make sure to click subscribe to see more. But for now, I've been David O'Sullivan, I'll see you next time. <laughs>